the first time I met him, I was like super overwhelmed. He's such a smart and intelligent guy. I've just come here to learn things. Uh, do things like swimming, jumping, climbing. No. So what is the whole purpose of going fast? As I get faster and faster, I become absolutely cool. But Sadhguru, I really want to know what do you do to unwind? I don't wind up. First of all. <laughs> There are millions of people following us. You think there's some, some sort of responsibility towards us on… Just stay loyal to one thing, that your wonderfulness is not compromised for any damn thing. I have had the pleasure of um, meeting the man that I'm going to introduce on stage now before. The first time I went to meet him, I was like super overwhelmed. I was like, oh my, because he's, he's Sadhguru, right? In your head, you're like, don't say stupid things, do not say stupid things. And then I went and I met him and I realized that he's literally as chill, fun, amazing like you and I. And I am super excited about this session. Are you pumped? Awesome. Um, so on this discussion, I have, uh, it's not just me, uh, this is going to be graced by two other very amazing YouTubers. So I'd like to welcome on stage Mumbai Kar Nikhil and Be Unique. Whenever you're ready guys, let's make some noise. What's up guys? Once more. What's up, Machas? So, fun story time. Nikunj forgot to pack an outfit for today. As always. And uh, we told him that we are dressing up, so you should dress up. <laughs> so, he's the only one dressed up now. I thought it was fun in my head. Sorry about that. I am with him. You with? No, yes, but yes, you yes. look very, yeah. <laughs> that was the joke. That True. was the plan. Fine, whatever. I'll <laughs> let that pass. Anyway, so this is happening. Um, this is a great platform for people like us to talk to Sadhguru. I have had this pleasure before and I remember the, I, the one hour that I spent talking to you was the calmest hour I've had in the longest time. <laughs> and it's, I just didn't know that you could feel like that, you know, when you're talking to somebody. Um, so to begin with, obviously, we have questions. All of us, we are a generation of questions, we always have them, we're always asking. I know, we asked questions before you were. Oh, great. So then we're taking that forward. Yeah. That's perfect. Uh, I have three questions primarily. So the first one um, is, I'm, I'm going to jump right into it. You know when you're in this age, when you're in college, when you're just out of school, you're in college, you're under 25, uh, <laughs> um, every little thing that goes wrong in life feels like the end of the world. For example, a heartbreak. Breakups are bad, right guys? Breakups are tough, failing in exams, fighting with your <laughs> Why is that funny? It's bad. Fighting with your family, getting in a fight, getting in a fight with your teachers, friends. And at that moment in time, it just feels like the, the worst thing to happen to us. And then eventually in a few years, you get to a place where you look back and you're like, yeah, Patani, why I was stressing over this so much? But in the, in the time that you spent stressing over these things that went bad, you end up sort of like doing more damage. Do you get me? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so what is your advice to all of us young people about this? You know, when the, every little thing that goes wrong in life at this age feels like the worst thing to happen to us. Namaskaram and good afternoon to all of you. Well, uh, it's not just under twenty-five people doing this nonsense. <laughs> Even the sixty-year-olds are still doing the same nonsense. So, uh, he was just asking me, Nikunj was asking me, uh, or somebody else was asking me just now why I decided to do this youth and truth and under twenty-five, all this. Well, it's a constant thing for me wherever I go in the world, fifty, sixty-year-olds come up to me and say, 
after going with… through something with me, they say, Sadhguru, where were you when I was twenty, twenty-five? You came when I'm sixty, what is the use now? So I heard this for a long time, then I decided, okay, let me step out and meet all those people who are below twenty-five years of age, because youth is a certain level of energy. But the problem with youth is, uh, by the time they figure out, by the time they bring some clarity to themselves, this energy is not a permanent thing, it will go down slowly. Well, I am an exception <laughs> But you will see most people slowly sink. But before the energies go down, if you had clarity, this would fire you in the right way. So it's like you're in a room, you can't figure out which is the door. If you had lot of energy, you would break your head. So I thought this should happen to people as early as possible, so that's why. But what uh, advice would you give them? What… what should be the thought… what should be the first… what can be the first thought when we feel like everything's going wrong? Well, uh, we need to understand this. We are born here with nothing and we'll die with nothing. In between whatever the hell is happening, you're on the profit side. <laughs> no matter what is happening, you're still gaining, you can't lose and anyway, Life is not like your school or college, no matter which way you live, everybody shall pass, so what's the problem? <laughs> you didn't get it <laughs> What? Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> I missed that. Yeah, I was like, what? I said, everybody shall pass, they didn't get it, I said. Sir, upar jayenge. Nobody is detained, I'm saying, because you live not the right way, somebody gets detained, no such thing, everybody shall pass. So, just the most important thing is you live, to live and to live totally. Living totally does not mean party seven days of the week. Living totally means every dimension that is there for a human being to explore must happen. It's very important. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Does one get less creative as they age and if yes, why? Like Not me <laughs> Most of the people <laughs> So I Most think of the people. Uh, being uh, creative versus ex getting experience, that's what no, I feel. As they, as they age, the family, children, problems, solution, uh, office, money… If they're problems, you could drop them, but can you live without them? Of course not, but creative, so creativity <laughs> So the thing is, See, people, one fundamental problem is we have created an education system where you're misunderstanding memory and information as intelligence. This is the biggest mistake we've made. This is the reason why someone who is growing up in a city looks smarter than somebody is in the village, simply because of information. Information is not intelligence. Anyway, all these people who have some information in their head and they think they're very intelligent are going to be seriously disappointed because Machine learning is coming, there will be… if you are… if you are a PhD in something, your phone will know more than the PhD. So, this pretense of having memory, pretending that memory is intelligence has to go. Now, young and old is just a question of the burden of memory that you carry. You don't know how to carry your memory. What… see, we must understand this. People are not suffering their life, they are suffering two most fantastic faculties that we have, that only we have, no other creature on this planet has. One is a vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination. So, this is all people are suffering. What happened ten days ago, you're suffering. What may happen day after tomorrow, you already suffer. You are not suffering life, you are suffering your memory and your intelligence. When are you going to learn to handle this? Is twenty-five too early, you think? No. You must figure it out as quickly as possible, how to handle my memory and my imagination to my benefit. If you don't know this, twenty-five or fifty-five or sixty-five, you'll be still the same. Because sixty-year-old people think they have a right to worry themselves to death. You don't have to worry yourself to death, death will anyway come. I'm saying there's no need to work for it <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to budge in here. You said that… Um, you know, death is going to come. No, no, I didn't say that it comes anyway. It comes anyway. <laughs> That's like it's that. It's going to come anyway. I'm not saying you said no, no. so it's coming, but it's going to come anyway. <laughs> just that most people think other people die. 
No, no, you and me will die <laughs> But then, uh, is that the thought you have when you are speeding in a car at Siachen? Or on a bike at, actually. On a bike, sorry, on a not bike. in a car. <laughs> when you are being the rider that you are, standing on your bike and you are going through like snow-clad, <laughs> hilly, Say dangerous yeah. regions. What is the thought in your mind? I want to know that. Oh, generally I have no thought in my mind <laughs> This is a very important thing, that people think thought is a big thing. Thought is not the biggest thing in your life. Thought is just recycling of the data that you already have, nothing new happens in it. So if you want to recycle your trash can, you can go on doing it. But the important thing about life is, you have enhanced your sense of perception, that constantly you're drinking more life. No, I mean not the other things, okay? <laughs> I mean life. Life. <laughs> You're drinking in more life all the time. So where is the room for thought? So about speed, speed is not for me, uh, people think is it your adrenaline? I have no adrenaline. Actually as I get faster and faster, I become absolutely cool. And uh, <laughs> my right leg is always heavy when I sit in a car, so... <laughs> oh my god. The speed is not about adrenaline, speed is about competence. It's… it's… if there is no competence, it's just adrenaline, you may kill yourself or somebody else. It's very important, it is a question of competence. So, is death on your mind? This is one thing I have done to myself, not for a moment I ever forget that I am mortal. I always know I could fall dead right now. Because of this, if you know that it's a brief amount of time that you have in this world, you would live totally, isn't it? A whole lot of people think they're immortal, that's their only problem. That's why they're postponing their joy and their wonderful nature to tomorrow. They think they can do it tomorrow. So if, they know, if there's no adrenaline, when you're driving fast or riding fast, what is the main purpose of going fast? As a human being, we uh, do things like swimming, jumping, climbing, because we love the drug which is being produced inside <laughs> our head, right? No. So what is the whole purpose of going fast? The whole purpose of going fast is just this. There is something in a human being, ultimately in this world, in human society, in the… among the monkeys, among the lizards, among everybody, ultimately the only thing that is valued is competence in their world, wherever they are. So, like driving at a certain speed through difficult terrain is more a test of yourself, whether you can do it or not is the question. And just to get to that edge all the time, if you get adrenaline, you will not go very far because your competence will go away. What do you enjoy when you drive fast? I… I don't enjoy anything in particular, I just made sure all the time I'm joyful, I do whatever the hell I can. Do you see what I meant by, you know, he's so chill in life, I, like I, he's… I thought I'm hot. You're… you're hot, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Listen, I'll give him that and that outfit, I'm gonna give him that. But in life, I feel like being hot-headed is… It's, it's not something you are, you're more chill. <laughs> you're this is more my getting relaxed. old goals. Huh? This is my getting old goals. <laughs> getting old goals. Chill, <laughs> and as… as hot… And as, as chill as, as possible. Everyone, everyone has a different adrenaline, that's what I'm saying. The reason no, that no, I drive fast… This is a very generational thing, when we were growing up, if we saw something really nice, we saw, oh man, it's hot. <laughs> now you're saying it's cool. I think it's because of global warming maybe. <laughs> Everything else is hot <laughs> See, I was saying like the… my… the reason I drive fast and is not to get adrenaline rush, is so that I can get on time and get the Dumbuli local bro. So everyone has a different reason of getting… City boy, yeah. <laughs> um, Sadhguru, my second question for you would be, um, on a more funner side since we're taking it Abbas child, we know that when you were a child, you were a very quiet child. You didn't speak much, but your teachers say that they looked at you and they knew you were always up to some mischief. Also, there's a lot of very… Most of the time, they didn't see me because I was not in the class. Uh, whenever they did, <laughs> whenever they did… Probably so, in the canteen. Like. In the canteen or wherever it was. Oh, so how went, were you… I went, I went much further. Yes, we… we <laughs> We would like to know about how further that was. Oh. We want to… we want to hear a story from then, we would love to know that. Just yesterday, two of my teachers 
who were in high school in the demonstration school in uh, Mysore, you know, re the regional school of education, they came to visit our yoga center. So now they were all overwhelmed seeing the center and the work that's happening. <laughs> so they were asking me, you know, the one teacher did not remember my face or anything about me. I said, that's because ma'am, you were teaching algebra and I never was there. So it's not your fault that you don't remember me <laughs> So how further, uh, should I tell, should I expose myself like this in front of… We would love to know. We would love to know. We want to know. See, for me, I… I found everything… Fortunately, the school was located in a place where there was a whole lot of nature, there was a lake close by and forest and everything. So for me, I got so engaged with those things. My… if you want to know my first venture, they put me to school uh, at the age of three and a half. I was three and a half years old and they put me to school because I was kind of spilling out of the house a bit. <laughs> so this maid holds me by the hand and takes me and leaves me in the school. I kind of after a few days I resisted that she can't hold my hand and take me to the class. So I made a deal with her, you have to leave me near the gate. So she left me at the gate and of course I did not go into the school. I found the Grand Canyon, really. And I explored life and it was so fantastic. Over three months passed like this and somehow they discovered I have not been going to school for three and a half months. But the worst thing they did was when I came home, they were all accusing me, you have been playing in the gutter. They reduced a Grand Canyon into a gutter. So in my experience, it was like a Grand Canyon. I collected a whole lot of species. Maybe, I don't know, I was working for a biology PhD or something, but they made all that into trash and said you are playing in the gutter. I, was, I thought I was the youngest guy to bunk, like I bunked school in sixth standard, but then <laughs> no comparison. <laughs> Three and a half years old, no one can beat that. Also speaking of schooling and parents and careers, you know, we're in… right now, we're in an age where there's so many different offbeat careers coming up. As YouTubers, we get this question all the time. You know, uh, the, how did you talk to your parents about it? How do we convince our parents about this really new career that we have? I want to ask you, you know, if you had to convince your parents and tell them that this is what you… or what… how did that discussion go? Did that happen where you had to sit them down and tell them that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? I want to do YouTube now, like did that… did that happen with you too? He's <laughs> doing YouTube right now, like uh, into YouTube, right? <laughs> Well… Uh, not everybody can be convinced about everything, okay? Some things are just done. So just to give you an example, when I… when I uh, passed my twelfth standard, at that time it was called PUC, after that I decided I will educate myself, I don't want to go to college. This is a family where everybody is educated, not going to college is like sacrilege. At least today there is a little more uh, flexibility. Those days, it's like if you don't go to college, you're finished. Because now probably if you don't go to college, you may lose your lifestyle, but you won't lose your life. That was a generation, if you don't go to college, you lost your life, you're on the street, that's about it. So they were terrified of this. My father being a physician, he was just freaked about it <laughs> He is a very studious man, all his life, first, second, third in every thing that he has done. So he couldn't believe this, that I want to educate myself. So I did one thing and because of this suddenly everybody thought I'm become some kind of an enemy and uh, they were not even talking to me properly. I did one thing. I was a… <laughs> just to tell you, I was such a big eater. I would eat ten times, eat more… at least ten times of what I eat today. But I never was putting on weight or anything but it's because my level of physical activity was such. Uh, I could just run up a coconut tree, I was made like that <laughs> So I was every day cycling about fifty, sixty kilometers, swimming in the Kaveri and going back like this, so eating this. I decided to go to the Mysore University library. Every day when they open at nine, I went, eight in the evening they close. That entire time, I sat there 
read all kinds of stuff, from Homer to popular mechanics to National Geographic to literature to geography, this, that, whatever. Whatever came my way, every day for one year I read like this, just all kinds of things. But the most important thing for me was, though I was such a huge eater at that time, this one year I went without a meal. Morning I ate as much as I could, breakfast at home and I went there and sat there the entire day without a meal, which was a huge achievement for me because without food I could stay. This kind of expanded my way of looking at life. But, uh, you know, family drama started, my mother started crying, when the next academic year comes, go to college, go to college, go to college. Then I said, if I must go to college, I'll go for literature. My father said, what will you do reading poetry? You must become a doctor, he has a seat ready for me in the medi you know, military, medi medical college, everything. I said, no. Then they said, uh, okay, at least do engineering. Then I said, see, Please do engineering. <laughs> if I say I don't want to be a doctor, if you told me become a veterinary doctor, Ayurvedic doctor, at least a witch doctor, <laughs> I would look at it. If I say no doctor, you say engineer. I'm not going to listen to this. Your problem is society, your problem is not me. So I just went for literature and these three years, I went there in the beginning and they all had ready-made notes, the teachers, they would read and everybody writing down. Those days fountain pens, kara 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 kara, it makes noise, it just irritated me. I said, I don't want to listen to this kara kara noise, I gave them a suggestion. If you give that notes wherever you got it, we will photocopy it and give it back to you. We don't have to come, you don't have to come. <laughs> then it… you know, if I'm there, I'll ask hundred questions. So they didn't like it, then I made a deal with all the teachers that they'll give me attendance, that was my only concern. So once a month I just… once a month I went to college just to check if they're keeping their part of the deal <laughs> My life is so similar, yeah. So I explored the you geography see? of well, Mysore district in such a way, every village track, every hill that is there, every little bird nest, whatever is there, everything I paid attention, paid attention, just wandering aimlessly. But today, like when I went for the rally for reverse board where all the top experts are there, some questions came up and I just telling them casually, they said, Sadhguru, how do you know all this? I said, what… what was aimless wandering? Where I paid absolute attention to everything, from a worm to an insect to anything and everything I paid attention, now it's become formidable knowledge. I never intended to learn anything, I just paid attention because it was life and this is all it takes we have come here to live, there is no other damn purpose. Those of them who want to go to heaven can go today, why are they postponing? <laughs> if it's such a great place, I don't see why you should postpone it, isn't it so? <laughs> this is very important for the youth. If anybody says there is a better place than this earth, it is a crime. It's because of that we have destroyed so many things here. I wanted to ask you one thing, as young entertainers and like, uh, as, we, as you all know that we've got YouTube channels and there are millions of people following us, you think there's some, some sort of responsibility towards us on like how to go about it or we should just do what we like to do? Uh, what is it that you would like to do? Let's look at that first. See, essentially everybody is doing whatever they're doing, mainly because they think in some way it enhances their life, it brings pleasure to them, it makes you wonderful. Have you been… certain moments of your life, I'm sure you've been absolutely wonderful to yourself and to everybody around you, isn't it so? All you have to do is just be loyal to that one thing, that you're always wonderful, that's all. Rest of it will naturally happen according to your intelligence and capability, what has to happen will happen. You just be absolute loyalty to your own wonderfulness. This is like it once happened, there was a man called Shankaran Pillai who was running a pet shop. And uh, someone came and uh, they wanted to buy a dog. There was a reasonably grown-up dog, a golden retriever. He said, I would like to take the dog, how much is it? He said, twenty-five thousand rupees. He said, come on, for a full-grown dog, twenty-five thousand, why? 
He said, he's too wonderful. He said, yes, it's a wonderful dog, but twenty-five thousand, that's a price. So he paid the money, he took, petted the dog, the dog was very friendly. Then he was just about to leave, he asked, but is this lo dog loyal? Shankaran Pillai said, absolutely loyal, I sold him twelve times, within hours he's back <laughs> So no matter what is happening, just stay loyal to one thing, that your wonderfulness is not compromised for any damn thing, it's important. So the moral is, you should be loyal and you should be unique. Seamless branding like It's quite, quite a shameless plug there, <laughs> we're going to let that go. Um, but Sadhguru, I really want to know what do you do to unwind? I don't wind up. Sadhguru. Great, this is… <laughs> listen, one second. Woo! Swamiji, you stop this. do you remember I <laughs> said this is going replies. to be his answer? I was backstage and I'm like, I really want to know what he does to chill and what he does to unwind. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he's going to say, I don't wind. But no, for real though, other than we know that there's a fun side to you, your sense of humor is great, you have all these cool cars and bikes and all of no, that. No, nothing. <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> somebody, somebody, because when they want their car or motorcycle to be really driven, they bring it to me. So I give it the box. <laughs> but is it uh, we true? We are meeting backstage, right? Huh? Ujit is though. We can be a meeting yeah, backstage, car, right? But is it true that if anything goes wrong with your uh, bike or car, you'll not let anyone touch it and you will make sure it's okay by yourself? Uh, that was long time ago. Now I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> awesome. I think uh, we're going to open this up to the audience because I'm pretty sure a lot of us have a lot of questions. So, um, we'll go one by one. Do we have a mic in the audience though? Perfect. Okay, hello Sadhguru. Um, I wanted to know what, what, what is the one major difference you see between the youth of your time, like when we, you were young, mm -hmm. you're still young but uh, literal senses, and um, <laughs> the youth of this generation, like what's one major difference and what's that one quality you would want of that youth to be imbibed in this generation? Uh, if you ask me what's the major difference, what yes. I saw… This is what, the difference. Uh, what I saw going around meeting a lot of youth of today is, during our time, we were always thinking about what we can do for this nation, what we can do for this world, how to cause a revolution <laughs> about something. Always the debates and discussions were around that. But today, most youth are only talking about their own personal aspirations, which was quite… Uh, I don't know, it's amusing and also little alarming sometimes. Uh, but at the same time, it is largely because of the economic comfort you have today, which was not there at that time, that's the main reason. So if… Uh, because in this country, we're still not one nation, all right? There are people who are living in the highest level of comforts and well-beings, there are people who are somewhere in between, at least you can easily make this country into five layers of uh, existence, literally. Just now, uh, I was in Trichy this morning and uh, I was talking to the farmers, if you look at their condition, it's a large congregation of uh, farmers in Tamil Nadu. If you look at them and if I look at you, this is a different world altogether, it's not the same world. So because it's like this, still there are parts of India which needs some revolutionary action. There are parts of India where personal aspiration is good enough, I think uh, it's important that there's a part of you which constantly thinks about how to cause some kind of a major difference to the larger populations. This must be there in our minds, it's important. All right, let's take… we've got time for two more questions, I think. And I'm not going to choose, I'm not going to be the villain here. Akshay? Hi, Jova's here. Hey guys. Hi Sadhguru. So, I have to say, I really appreciate how… how much of a healthy mind it seems that you have. The way that you process information, the way that you experience the world, the way that you are… you seem to be present at all times, even the way that you're putting that much of attention in me, really appreciate that presence. Um, I talk a lot about mental health with the youth. Um, it is a word that 
more and more I become uncomfortable saying, because when you say mental health, you're already separating the other holistic health to one that focuses only on the mind, right? And when I talk about mental health, for me is body health, is spiritual health, and it's not only the mind, right? Um, I wear a shirt that says breathe, because for me it's also connected to the, to the body. My question for you is, can you talk a little bit about the connection between the mental health and the spiritual health? Because I see so many similarities in the way that you're experiencing the world, which seems in a, a very spiritual way, but I also don't even want to call it spiritual because it would be creating a division of how to experience the world. So, you, can you, you share some? You better avoid that word because it's the most corrupted word on the planet right now. <laughs> so, let me put it this way. In the yogic sciences, there is no separation between what is body and what is mind. We talk about the body like this, physical body, mental body, emotional body, energy body, etheric body and uh, there is what is called as Anandamaya Kosha. So the five bodies is what we are talking about, we are not talking about a mind. Because what is it that you call as a mind? If there is a certain volume of memory and a certain amount of intelligence attached to it, that's what you call as a mind, isn't it so? Yes, it is. Is it so? Hello? <laughs> Why are you not in talking terms with me? So, if you look at this, every cell in your body has much more memory and much more intelligence than your entire brain has. For example, memory. You definitely don't remember how your great-great-great-grandfather ten generations ago looked like, but his nose is sitting on your face right now. Your body remembers even a million years ago how your forefather's skin tone was, not forgotten a thing. This kind of memory processing is not possible in your brain, for sure. And when it comes to intelligence, what is happening in a single molecule of DNA is so complex, your whole brain is not good enough to figure that process. So both in terms of memory and intelligence is a lot more all across this body than just here. This has become important mainly because we have uh, kind of taken education straight out of uh, European culture and put it here. In the European culture, thought became very important because they went through about three hundred to four hundred years of very dogmatic religious practices that anybody who thinks something different was dead. So they broke away from that about hundred and fifty years ago which they called as renaissance which was a big breakthrough for them, that they could think for themselves. Otherwise, everything that you need to say is already said in one book. If you say one more thing, you're dead. This was the culture. So they made thought, human thought into a very big thing. But you understand this, whatever kind of thought you have is only from the limited data that's coming, that's already stored in your mind, isn't it so? With this limited data, you may make permutations and combinations of it, but nothing new will ever happen. So, when we say mind or manas, we are looking at a dimension as memory as a separate silo, which is all across the body, there's more memory in every cell in the body than here, and we are looking at intelligence as chitta, as something totally different. So to keep these two things separate is most important. It is only your memory which gets corrupted. It's in your memory that you go sick. You cannot go sick in your intelligence. If I speak this, people will become very, you know, they think it's not compassionate to say these words, but I want you to understand this. This is because we have gotten trapped in our own memory bubble that this memory can go corrupt. What happened ten years ago, it can rot in your mind and become something very big after some time and cause this. Well, people always will argue, but there is a chemical process, yes. This is the most sophisticated chemical factory on the planet. The question is only, are you a great CEO or a lousy CEO? There is a way that you can keep your chemistry the way you want. Just look at my eyes and see, I'm always stoned. Yeah. Never touched a substance, always stoned and I can calibrate <laughs> I can calibrate how intoxicated I want to be or how less I want to be any moment. 
This is not something… see the… the important thing is this, the question is not about intoxication being good or bad. The problem is it takes away your faculties, that is a problem. So as we looked at it earlier, one of the most important thing for a human being is that our actions are successful. Whether you are driving or riding or doing something, if you throw a ball, it must go where you want, otherwise you feel not good because the purpose of human action is success. So if success has to happen, your body and your mind must take instructions from you. So with with alcohol, drug, the problem is your body and your mind won't take instructions from you, that's a whole problem. So we are not against intoxication, we are against you becoming incompetent, that's the important thing. So I, we can show you a way that you can simply sit here and totally toned out without anything from outside. You want to tone it down this moment, you can just tone it down and do what you want. Absolutely no impact on the system. This is not just talk like that, there's a whole lot of research on this. Scientists have found that there, is, there are millions of uh, cannabis re receptors in your brain. Why is it there? Because your body is supposed to produce it, you're not supposed to smoke. You're supposed to produce it in your system. And the Israeli scientists who research this extensively call that dimension of chemistry in us as Ananda mind. Because he did not find any appropriate word, he searched the Indian scriptures and found the word Ananda and called it Ananda mind that if you want, you can just be blissed out right now. So if you are blissed out, will you get crazy, I'm asking? Well, others think crazy, you're… Cr other people may think you're crazy because you're always blissed out, that's their problem, they're the ones who are crazy. Because they've lost their bliss, even the little joy that they had as children, that also they've lost. They're carrying such a grave face as if they're practicing their last posture in their life. Yes? I'm telling you, you don't have to practice, it'll naturally come. When you die, you get the posture. You don't have to practice out all the time on the street <laughs> So, mental health, looking at it separately is not the best way to do it. You must look at the physical, chemical balance within the system. If this one thing you manage, being physically well, mentally well is a natural consequence. The problem with the whole kind of education we have is, we want the consequence without the process. You don't bother about the consequence, you handle the process right, the consequence will happen. Now you want… mangoes are coming already there in Bangalore? Not or? yet, not yet. Not yet? Mango is sweet, everybody likes to eat it, but nobody is interested in the tree. If you nurture the tree, mangoes will fall on your head, you don't have to dream about mangoes, anyway it'll come. Instead of nurturing the tree, people dream about mangoes, this is called as being goal-oriented. In yoga we say, if you're goal-oriented, you have one eye on the goal. You have one eye on the goal and only one eye to find your way, you have become incompetent. It's very important that today, this moment, whatever the hell you're doing, to do it as well as you can, is more important than what will happen in the end, what will happen in the end. There's no such thing. Somebody, uh, one of the celebrities in the country coming and asked me, Sadhguru, can you tell us how we can beat Pakistan in the cricket match? I said, beating what Pakistan… beating Pakistan is Indian Army's job, you bloody hit the ball, huh? <laughs> How's the josh? <laughs> All right, we've got one more question right there, Akshay. Okay, by the way guys, little piece of good news, it's not last three questions, we've got a lot of time on us, so it's cool, it's chill. I just want to like, I'm um, sorry, just before the, taking the question, I just wanted to ask, so if you're not goal-oriented, goal I feel that you push your goal too. So, what do you have to say about this? When you it's not just the process. No. See, well, to set a direction, we have a goal, all right? Whether you want to go this way or this way, you created a goal, but that's all the job is. Once you… once the goal has set the direction, it is a question of efficiency of walking or riding or driving or whatever the means of going there, isn't it? This will… see, everybody has a desire to win, but your desire is only a direction. Your desire doesn't do anything else. A desire sets you in a certain way. Desire doesn't get you to win, every fool wants to win. 
but only who… those who play well will win, isn't it? I want to ask you one thing, what makes us a human being? You said we can get stoned whenever we want to, so what makes us a human being? And you think <laughs> greed… I thought you were already born a human being. No, 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 what makes you a human? That's… that's science. <laughs> what makes you a human being, you know, okay. not the organs. Mm. Talking about what is the whole purpose? Does greed uh, plays an important role in the evolution of a human being? And if we… if we make… if we see the life so easily, like, you know, if you want to get stoned, so easy… Oh, no, 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 I'm not talking about getting stoned as no, no, becoming… No no. no, no, this is important. See, because till now you have understood the word stoned as sitting in some one place like this, like a dead chicken. <laughs> No, no, I'm asking. That's I'm why Nikhil is not taking off his glares actually. <laughs> yeah, stone. I'm talking about… I, I have mastered the technique also by the way. <laughs> That's why. I'm talking about being stone means you are in a state where no matter what is the nature of activity you're doing, with who you are, what is the result happening or not happening, you're still on, all the time you're on because you're stoned, otherwise you would be, be affected. But Right now, people's idea of being stoned is sit in a corner like a dead chicken. That's not my idea of being stoned. You're hugely empowered because you're intoxicated. So what is the purpose? Purpose. You want to know? <laughs> now, uh, what makes you a human being? See, there are many creatures. People say approximately there are over a trillion creatures on this planet. I, I just want to cut you. Like my father used to tell me like uh, I was a very… Uh, dumb child, like I never used to I focus on studies <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I used to ask a lot of questions, you know, I No, I never no, used because to I'm your father's age, I'm saying I can understand. I never used to understand anything, I was… I say that's I was very bad in studies, I was… I uh, was you cannot say. I can say, I'm your his father's age, I can say. So, it's like… he's like being sad, being greedy, being yeah. hardworking, you know, it's… It, that makes you human, that's a part of your life. You… you ask the question, you're trying to answer it, what is no, this? I, I just want to know, like, <laughs> I was listening to you So what makes you a human being? There are over trillion creatures on this planet, from worms to insects to birds to animals, all kinds. Many of them fantastic creatures, a lot of people even call themselves uh, that I'm a tiger, all right? Many are calling themselves lions, but tigers, lions, elephants, no matter what they are, they just call that. We never call them a tiger being or a lion being or an elephant being. Only for you, we said you are a human being. This is because you are the only one who has the capability that if you exercise your choices, you know how to be. None of them know how to be. They're all programmed for compulsive reactions. They exist in a world where it's all by compulsive, instinctive reactions, but you know how to be. But human beings are trying to prove that they don't know how to be. They just don't know how to be most of them, unfortunately. They're trying to prove the nature wrong. But you know how to be. Only thing is, you must keep your choices open. Choices means, right now, is it true, if you wish, you can sit here, and look at the person next to you, think some really horrible things about this person sitting next to you and get a little depressed, why am I sitting next to this horrible creature? Possible or no? Possible. Or you can look at them nicely and think wonderful things about them or don't even have to think anything. If you don't think anything, simply look at another life, you can sit here in wonderful company. Possible or no? So you being wonderful or horrible right now is a choice. Are you exercising the choice or are you falling back in evolution and behaving compulsively? That's all the big difference. A human has the capacity to be a conscious life and we also do the same things. They are born, we are born, they eat, we eat, they reproduce, we reproduce, they die, we die. We're doing the same things. But the big difference is we can do it consciously. They do it as a programmed system. This one thing if you do, suddenly you will see your experience of life is so phenomenal that it is such a big phenomena, what is the meaning of life? Such a question will never come to you. There is no such thing as meaning of life. It's a phenomena beyond all meanings. 
if there is no profoundness of experience, if you are living on the surface, especially if you are living in the thought process, then you are thinking, what is the meaning? Because all you have is words. When you're full of words, you want a meaning for the word. Tell me what is the meaning of a tree? Tell me what is the meaning of a bird? Tell me what is the meaning of the cloud? What is the meaning of the empty sky? Is there some meaning to it? Meanings exist only in human heads. The universe has no meaning. It's too fantastic to be trapped in a meaning. That's the universe. All right, let's take… Guys, tell us your name so we'll know you. Uh, Namaskaram Sadhguru, my name is Rakesh. First of all, thank you so much for being here, I should say on this planet to guide us. Oh, I've been <laughs> here only <laughs> Do I, yes. I know I look… See, this happens to me. Whenever I, whenever I land in the United States, in the immigration, these days I have global entry, so it's okay. Otherwise, always I stood in the immigration where it's marked uh, resident alien. <laughs> I look around and see I'm the only one who fits the description. <laughs> So you are Sadhguru. I, I actually hear only. <laughs> yes. Uh, Sadhguru, uh, my question is… If you can hold it. Please. Yes. I know you want to speak from your heart but it works better. <laughs> <this>. Okay <laughs> I'm quitting… I'm quitting comedy now, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sadhguru, my question is, uh, I have seen um, youngsters, okay, they are addicted to drugs or alcohol, um, they smoke, and I have even heard, okay, uh, one of my friends telling uh, that… Uh, this is she just water, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I have even heard one of my friends telling, if I recollect uh, correctly, uh, that even Lord Shiva used to consume, okay, substance. Uh, and they take it as an excuse and they imitate it. Uh, saying that uh, even Shiva used to do it, okay, why should not uh, we imitate it? So that is the excuse which, uh, you know, few of uh, the youngsters, uh, you know, take it uh, to consume the substances. So what is your uh, advice to them? Well, uh, everybody is uh, these days asking, why can't all these things be made legal? Why do we have to buy it in the back street? I understand the logic. But uh, the thing is just this, why can't I smoke? What do you call it these days, huh? Okay, why can't… why can't I smoke up? <laughs> this is what it's called? I got you. <laughs> why can't I smoke up and go to my college? Well, the thing is just this, you can. Only thing is, Suppose you want to get on a plane, your pilot comes smoked up. <laughs> Would you like to go on that plane? Or let's say you need a surgery, your surgeon comes smoked up. <laughs> or uh, your cricket team goes to Australia and it's smoked up. <laughs> you like it? No. They will become a test. So, <laughs> this is all the question is. The question is just this. Do you want to live or do you want to avoid life? You know, you just asked us what it's called these days. I want to know what it was called back then. What was called? <laughs> <laughs> you just asked us what Smoking it is up. called these days. I want to know what it was called back then. They used to say doped up. Doped up. <laughs> I think we should get that back, right? It's way cooler than smoking up. Listen, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question, please. Akshay, you choose. If someone has to be murdered, it's you. Are you passing that parcel? We should say stop or what? Hi. Hello. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, it's an honor to be talking to you. Okay. Uh, I have a question. What do you think is more important to a youth? Being right and staying with the point or staying with the point, knowing that they're wrong, but admitting that they're wrong, they would be doubting their own self. It's not a doubt. <laughs> She's asking if you're smoked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, no, no. I'm not. This is how I am without being smoked up. Oh. You can only imagine. <laughs> so, uh, see, it's best, the sooner you get this in your life, it's best because if you look at life without a keyhole vision of what I want kind of life, if you look at it little larger life, there is no right thing to do in the world. There's no really something called as really right and really wrong. It is just that people are taking positions and saying, I am right, you are wrong. If you go in terms of in any situation with people, if you talk about who is right and who is wrong, of course I am right and you are wrong. This is the basis of all arguments and fights and everything else, conflict, isn't it? So instead of looking at what is right and wrong, what don't… why don't we see what is appropriate to the situations in which we exist? What is the most appropriate thing that I can do right now? What would be best for me and everything around me? That's what I do. This may not be the right thing. If you want to take examples like this, in Tamil Nadu traditionally they have this, a real man. A real man means is called Ayraane Konnavane, that means one who has slain a thousand elephants, he is the real man. Well, Virapan got half the way, <laughs> but we shot him dead as a criminal. So I'm saying those were times when elephants were just in such numbers, if people had to live to protect them, a man would go, not with a magnum 400, but with a sword or a spear and kill the elephant. That guy was a big hero because he killed the elephant. But today, if you kill the elephant, you know where you're going. So, the question is not about what is right and wrong. The question is what we are doing. Is it appropriate to the situations and the times in which we exist? Above all, see people are always talking about integrity as good versus bad, right versus wrong, morals, ethics, values. I'm. Uh, on camera I'm telling you, I have no morality. For me, my integrity comes from my humanity, not from my morality. Because morally correct people are doing the most horrible things on the planet. People who think they're morally correct, they do the most horrible things on the planet to each other, human beings and to larger groups, all kinds of things. If you don't let your humanity sleep, well, when you say humanity, the important thing is this because you asked what makes you a human being. In your brain, there is something called as a reptilian brain which is approximately the size of your fist. What is the rest of it? That is the cerebral cortex. So the fundamental difference is this, the reptilian brain always wants to set up boundaries. You uh, in Bangalore city are the dogs peeing all over the place, are they? Hello? I'm just asking, is life still working? <laughs> so he's peeing all over the place not because he has a urinary problem or something. He is building a pea kingdom. He's setting his boundary all the time. This is his nature. He cannot think beyond that. He has to set his territory, he has to set his kingdom. The most fantastic thing about the human being is, we can use another dimension of intelligence which has happened only to us on this planet that we can think beyond our boundaries, we can live without boundaries within ourselves. Well, we've still not built a world where we can erase the national boundaries and other boundaries and live, but at least in our minds we can erase our boundaries. If you do this one thing, if you have erased the boundaries in your mind of who is mine, who is not mine, do whatever the hell you want, everything will be right. All right, we'll take one last question, Akshay. Okay, if you want, you can ask me. Hello. Uh, hi, Sadhguru. Uh, my name is Pranoy, over here. I am 24 years old and… Oh, uh, you just one year short. After that, they'll throw you out of here, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess. So, I didn't have a specific question when I picked up this mic. This is something more personal. It's, and I… If you can hold it right, it's not very clear. Yeah, yeah uh, so this is not a very specific question or generic for that matter. I… Uh, I hope that this question will answer a lot of others… Hey, ask the question, what is this? 
so i just wanted to ask that there are goals that i want to achieve and i also know that there are certain things i don't I shouldn't do that will hinder my progress so there i am trying to find methods of accountability for myself where i can push myself and get that as you said that we all are trying to win in some ways but i'm not able to figure out methods of accountability within myself to reach that if that makes sense no it doesn't <laughs> i'll i'll answer the question anyway <laughs> i want to break it down i don't know if i like you know i have the similar question that i want to reach somewhere and there's few ethics of me which is stopping me to do certain things which will make me reach there faster so yeah ethics or models you can say so what do you do about it <laughs> should we concentrate on the goal and reach there faster or should be should i hold on to my ethics and morals and let it be a little slow and be there see uh, whatever you do in your lives i'm sure each one of you will go out and do so many different things but whatever you do is it very important it is relevant to the world in which we are living hello is it, is it very important is relevant Suppose you set a goal today, in next twenty-five years, this is where I want to be. In those twenty-five years, the entire situation changed, but you are still going that way because you want to get your goal. Isn't it a disaster? So everybody is thinking, my dream should be fulfilled. Let me tell you what's my blessing to you. How's the Josh? How's the Josh? <laughs> My blessing to you is, may your dreams not be fulfilled, let something that you could not dream of in your life happen to you. <laughs> because what can you dream of? I'm asking you, what can you dream of? Only a little exaggeration of what you already know, isn't it so? Can you dream of something, something totally, absolutely new which is not in your experience? So you are ruling out all the possibilities of life simply because you have set a goal, because somebody is telling you, you must be goal-oriented, goal-oriented, no. You don't be goal-oriented, constantly work on how to enhance this piece of life. It is like, uh, you know, you have a Maruti car, nothing wrong with it, it's a good car to go home and go to the office. But you want to race on the F1 track, well, four wheels are going to go in four different directions. <laughs> If you want to go on that kind of speed, you don't dream, you build a machine, isn't it? Similarly, if you really want to go somewhere in your life, you build this one. Don't worry about the damn goal, we don't know what opportunities the world will open up tomorrow morning. How do you know? Just… just make yourself into a fantastic human being. You will see, life opens up in a million different ways. But if you have one silly little dream and you work for it all your life, what is the point of that? So may your dreams not come true. Let something that you could not dream of happen to you. I feel like all three of us relate to this on a very personal level because Nick wanted to be a bartender. Nikhil wa uh, was the… In, in I was actually. He, yeah, he became a bartender. Nikhil was working um, as airline crew. I was working at a, as a radio jockey and I remember we, we have this conversation every now and then where we are like, you know, this was the goal we had. And then nobody saw YouTube coming, nobody saw this happening and then now suddenly we have a life where we can sit and talk to Sadhguru in person. So, so. don't waste your How life… How cool is this? <laughs> this is a new dream. Don't waste your life dreaming. Keep your eyes and every damn thing that you have open and look. There are a million doorways <laughs> I think this brings us to the end of this session. Uh, listen, again, I think the calmest hour we have spent, what do you guys think? <laughs> Two times in a row, thank you it. so… Yeah, I know it's a very weird vibe, like I was just like after our discussion, I remember just standing and thinking, I was like, what just happened? Did I even talk at all? Maybe I was stoned. Hey! <laughs> <Don't stop. laughs> well, thank you so much, thank Sadhguru. You. And thank you thank to you. everybody uh, who is here. Um, have fun, guys. It's going to be great. We're going to take your leave. Thank you. Bye, guys. Let's do a check. Okay, on that note, we'd like to get a picture with all of the panelists on stage. Would you all like a picture? Yes?
So just crowd around the middle and turn around and face the cameraman. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, to the panel on stage. There you go.